All right, we are looking at 10.2 today, estimating means with confidence. <clears throat> so a couple learning targets for you today. You should be able to determine whether the conditions are met for doing the inference about a difference between two means. Construct and interpret a confidence interval for a difference between two means. Analyze the distribution of means of, the, of differences in a paired test data set using graphs and summary statistics and construct and interpret a confidence interval for a mean difference. So starting off those conditions for mu1 minus mu2, this should look very familiar to um, 8.3 and then also a little bit of 10.1. So the randomness, the data comes from two independent random samples or from two groups in a randomized experiment. That allows us to extrapolate to larger groups um, or larger populations. The 10% condition is if you're sampling without replacement. So notice that this is a randomized experiment. You don't have to worry about the 10% condition. But if it is two random samples, you do want to check the 10% condition for both samples. N1 is less than 10% of, of big N1, and your sample N2 is less than 10% of your population N2. Both those should look very familiar from 8.3. And then this should look pretty familiar from 10.1. For normal and large samples, um, for each sample, the corresponding population distribution or the true distribution of responses in, to the treatment is normal or the sample size is larger than 30. Very familiar with what we saw. Um, you do want to check that for both samples, um, N1 and N2. If for some reason we don't know the shape and N is less than 30, we can use a graph of the sample data shows no skewness or outliers, and then still use the normal condition. All right. So take a look at this. We have a college student wants to compare. Well, I'll let you read it. Basically looking at the difference between prices of a one bedroom and a two bedroom, and we're going to check the conditions. So right off the bat, random samples. It tells us there. It says, do, 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 wants to compare the cost of one. She collects the following data on monthly rents and dollars uh, for a random sample of 10 apartments of each type. So random sample, we are good there. Independent random samples of 10, one bedroom, and 10 two-bedroom apartments. The 10% condition, we can assume that there's more than 10 apartments within um, close by her campus. So 10 is less than 10% of all one-bedroom apartments, and 10 is less than all 10 is less than 10% of all two-bedroom apartments. All right, here comes the normal size large samples. We don't know if the distribution is normal, and both ten, both sample sizes are 10, which is less than 30. So we do need to check. We have to use a third way to check, which to see if we graph the, the data on a dot plot. Is there outliers or is there a skewness? It doesn't really appear to be like that, so we are good to continue on. And reminder, to if you are going to use this third way to verify your conditions, you must draw a picture and give a sentence saying, hey, there are no outliers or strong students. So we're good to keep going. All right, now to actually calculate the confidence interval for mu1 and mu2. So this formula, this general formula is very familiar. Any confidence interval is a statistic plus or minus the critical value times the standard deviation. So our statistic here is going to be x bar 1 minus x bar 2. Seems very really familiar um, with our 8.3 p hat differences or difference in proportions. Now, the standard deviation, if we knew sigma, it's very nice that we could just use sigma 1 squared over n1 plus sigma 2 squared over n2. <clears throat> However, we don't usually know sigma 1 and sigma 2, so we can't use this formula. So we're going to have to use the sample standard deviation for both of them. And if we're going to use a sample standard deviation, well, then we're going to need a T star, not a Z star. So this will almost always be the formula you're going to use. X bar minus X, X bar 1 minus X bar 2 plus or minus that T star times the sample standard deviation um, for the difference between the two means, which comes out to this formula. All right, there's two ways to kind of use to find the degrees of freedom depending on which way you choose to do your calculations will kind of impact it. If you use option one, just straight up technology, there's a very long formula for degrees of freedom that your calculator will find for you. 
if you are going to do strictly by hand um, and you are going to use like the table to find your values, then you can just use the smaller of the two, n1 minus 1 or n2 minus 1, to find the degrees of freedom that way. So here's a little bit of an example. You can read it, pause me, and then get started in a second. Um, we are given the summary statistics and comparative box plots of the data. So it asks us um, to compare a few sentences to compare the size of the two types of longleaf pine trees. So remember, when we're comparing distributions, we could probably use that SOC method or solve. So center shape outlier center variability or shape outlier center spread. Same idea, that's a back in, I think, I believe, a unit four topic, a chapter four topic. So, shape the distribution of DBH in the northern sample appears to be skewed to the right. And you can see that long tail there. While the distribution of DBH in the south the sample appears to be skewed to the left. Here's a nice long tail that's been. Outliers, no outliers are present in either one of these samples. So, I need to center and variability. It appears trees, remember when you're saying things, when you're describing the two distributions, you do want to compare and contrast it to use words like ER to be larger, smaller, greater than stuff like that. So it appears that trees in the southern half of the forest have larger diameters. The mean and median DBH in the southern sample are much larger than the corresponding values for the northern sample. And you can see very obviously the medians are different, are substantially different. Variability, there is more variability in the DBH of the northern long leaf pines. The range, IQR, and standard deviation are all larger for the northern sample. I would say I'd probably just use range and or IQR. I probably wouldn't go much into the standard. Well, I mean, and they give you the standard deviation, so you're actually good to use that as well. Um, that's also how we know that the center of the mean is also larger, right? Um, the box plot only shows us the median to find the mean we were had to have been given it. Uh, and same thing with standard deviation. You can't really see standard deviation on a box plot. So if they don't give it to you, I would just stick to range or IQR. But remember, range and IQR are not an interval. It is a point. So for instance, the range for the north is about maybe about like 50, 58, depending on how what you estimate this left bar, the lower to be. Um, maybe about 58. It is not from 2 to 60. Okay, it's not an interval for range and IQR. It is a point value. Part 2 says to construct and interpret a 90% confidence interval for the difference in the mean. So, state, as always, the confidence level, 90%, and then what you're doing it for. So, mu1 minus mu2. And you're going to state what your mu's are. So, mu1 is the true mean of southern. And mu2 is the true mean of northern. So off the top of our head, we should be expecting a positive value here for mu1 minus or x bar one minus x bar two, just because our south is minus the north and the south is bigger. So after the state, we're gonna plan, we're gonna state what we're doing. We're doing a two sample t interval for mu1 minus mu2. Um and then our randomness, okay, we are, we have 30, we have random sample of 30 trees from each of the northern and southern, so we're good there. The 10%, there's certainly less, 10, 30 is certainly less than 10% of all trees in the northern half of the forest. And same likewise for the southern half. And then large counts, well, luckily, our, both our N1 and N2 are equal to 30, which are larger than, larger or equal to 30. So we are good with our normal conditions. The do phase. So luckily they gave us the information, so it's not too hard to calculate. Um, 30, our mean, our standard deviation. Um, you could use the calculator if I turn it on here. Boom, 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 boom. Second distribution. No. Step test. Two sample, two sample, Z interval. We want a T, two sample T interval. Enter. We have some statistics. So I'm going to enter it. Let's go 34.2. Yeah, 
14.26, the second one is going to be 23.70, standard deviation is 17.5, and 30. We're doing a 90% confidence interval, and when it says pooled, we're going to keep it as no. So make a note of that so you don't actually do the wrong thing. And then calculate. Do, 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 do. Boom, get it out. Mm, what's going on here? Ooh, I got my N to actually put 20, not 30. So I'm going to go back in there. So test, I'm going to table down to two sample T interval. Yeah, this should be 30 here. Enter, still no to the pooled. Calculate. And we wait. Boom, we get 3.936 to 17.725. And we see our degrees of freedom is 55.72. So it's a very messy formula to get that degrees of freedom, um, but the calculator can calculate it pretty easily for us. Um, if you were to do this by hand, um, obviously you're not going to be expected to find that degrees of freedom by hand. So you can just do n1 minus 1 or n2 minus 1, whichever one's smaller. Since n's are there, the same size, it's 30 minus 1 degrees of freedom of 29. We can use our table B to get our z star. 1.699, and then go ahead and use this formula. If you're going to use the calculator, which is totally okay, what I would suggest to do is you still need to fill out this formula to tell us where the numbers come from. You can't just plug into your calculator and get full credit. But instead of putting this the t star in, I would literally write plus or minus t star times this, and then I would write underneath the t star coming from calculator. So we can calculate it that way. All right. And you can see in these two problems, the using the, the, the degrees of freedom of 29 instead of 55 and some change, it doesn't change the interval all that much. It changes it by a tenth on both sides. So it's not too drastic of a change. All right. And then we're going to conclude. We are 90% confident that the interval from 3.9362 to 17.724 centimeters captures mu1 minus mu2, the difference in the, the difference in the true mean BBH of all southern trees and the true mean BBH of all northern trees. So it's important to remember what we are calculating. We did mu1 minus mu2, which is southern minus northern. And the reason why that's important to know. Uh, A lot of times they might ask you, so um, does this give us evidence that the south is bigger than the north or the north is bigger than the south? And it's important to remember what we did. We did south minus north. So since we get all positive values, since zero is not in this interval and we get all positive values, we do have statistical evidence to suggest that south is bigger than north. Okay. Um, if they were all minus, then that would be that north is bigger than south. Um, and if zero was captured inside the interval, we could not, we do not have statistical evidence to suggest one way or the other. Okay. This is just how to do it in the calculator. I kind of showed it already, uh, so I'm not going to spend too much time here. Uh, make sure the pooled is no, as I said. You could do this with lists. So if I go back to stat test, to sample t interval you could put in data if you had l1 and l2 keep the frequencies as one and two the confidence level in the pooled and you can calculate it that way so if you want some extra practice go back to the inter you could rewind the video to the one about the apartment prices and type it into your l1 and l2 and proceed that way
and you should get this as a check if you want to check your answers. All right, so AP test tip. The formula for the two sample t interval for mu1 minus mu2 often leads to calculation errors by students. Also, the interval produced by technology is narrower than the one calculated using the conservative method. As a result, your teacher may recommend using the calculator's two sample t interval feature to compute the confidence interval. Be sure to name the procedure two sample t interval for mu1 minus mu2 in the plan step. So the plan has the name of the procedure and the conditions. And then give the interval and the degrees of freedom in the do step. So like I said, um, if you're going to use the calculator, by all means, it's OK. Um, but you're not going to know what t star is. So say t star, and then underneath it, tell us t star from the calculator, and tell us what the degrees of freedom are from the calculator. All right. This is the one of the last main section headings. So comparing two means and paired data. So the difference is, is we might get data um, that we could use a difference of means like we just talked about, or it might actually be better to talk about it as paired data. And we'll see two examples of how paired data can come up. So first example, a researcher studied a random sample of identical twins who had been separated at ran had been separated and adopted at birth. In each case, one twin, twin A, was adopted by a high income family, and the other, twin B, by a low income family. Both twins were given an IQ test as a So if you remember back in chapter four, you can kind of see where this is going. It's almost like it's kind of look at a paired uh, a, a paired experiment. In a paired in, or a paired block experiment. Sorry, I can't talk for a second. So it's, um, it kind of looks similar to that, and we might see some overlap here. So we have twin A at the top and twin B at the bottom. So the idea is that in group A, right, they were twins both. One went to group A, one went or one went to a high income, one went to a low income. All right, and so you can kind of see well, like they are pretty similar in the two. So you might start to see um, them if this was an experiment as like one as a controlled, one as uh, gets the actual, um, is, gets the apple, actual implemented treatment is if this was an experiment. Um, so you might see that a little bit. So here's the box plot or the dot plots for it. So comparing Um, I'll show you how I would actually do this to get these answers, but you could then, if we're going to like describe it, same idea, um, the mean and the standard deviation, or we'll talk about means here, x bar A is larger than x bar B, um, if you had just done the mean calculations for them. You could also talk about the variability in the IQ scores for the two groups. You could, if you did the mean, it's probably not too hard to find the standard deviation. Or you could use range potentially, um, whatever seems fit for you to de describe variability. Usually, though, remember if we use mean, we use standard deviation. If we use median, median, we use IQR or range. So remember that that those how those correspond with each other. So we're talking about mean here. I'm going to talk about the standard deviation. Um, and this is a, a little hint of what we're going to do. With so much overlap between the groups, the difference in means does not seem statistically significant, right? There's not too much of a difference between um, 109 and 103. It's not too much of a difference here. And you can see, hey, there's really only a couple people that are much lower and only two people higher. So is that really a difference? Kind of hard to see through it all. So what paired data is, is it results from recording two values of the same quantitative variable for each individual or for each pair of similar individuals. So in this case, these we would be talking about the second half, each pair of similar individuals, right? We would expect twin one and twin two um, or twin A and twin B in group one to be pretty similar since they are twins. Um, so that's why we're following in this each, they're kind of pairing up with each other. 
is that match paired design of an experiment. Um, and so when we do that, we can find the difference to get here. Um, one way to do this is if you go into our stats edit, you can put the data in L1 and L2. From there, you could do stat, stat calc one var stat for L1. Press enter. If you have the new calculator, just table down to where it, like where it's pulling the data from, and you want an L1. If it asks for frequency, you just want to type in one. But we can see our X bar and our standard deviation. If I wanted to do it for L2, one of our stat, L2. And I did that by second, the two button to get my L2. Press enter, boom, and I got my X bar there, my mean there. Now, if I want to find the difference, what I can actually do is press enter. I'm going to go into L3. I'm going to go up to the top and press enter. Notice how my cursor jumped down here. I'm going to do that again. Stat, edit, and uh, I'm in L3 right now. Here's my cursor. If I table up, my cursor is now on the L3 name. If I press enter, it jumps down here. And this allows me to do calculations in my data. So I can actually do second L1 minus second L2. Press enter. And now L3 has my differences. It's 128 minus 120 is 8. 104 minus 99 is 5. 108 minus 99 is 9 and so forth. I have all of them matched up with each other. All right. And now I can actually do stat calc one var stat. And I want to do it on L3 because L3 is my difference. And boom, I get my, my X bar to be 5.833. My standard deviation, my sample standard deviation is 3.93 as well. So that's how you would get that data point here into your calculator. This is just a caution for how the data was produced. We talked about how here um, we are in the second form for each pair of similar individuals. We are pairing up these individuals. So we're good to continue on with a paired data um, approach. And so if we're going to use paired data, which we are, Start by computing the difference for each pair, then make a graph of the differences using the mean and standard deviation for the difference as summary statistics. All right. This is the other method of a paired design. So if we read this problem now, does music help or hinder performance in math? Students, student researches researchers abigail caroline and leah design an experiment using 30 student volunteers to find out each subject to find out each subject competed a 50 question single digit arithmetic test with and without music playing for each subject the order of the music and no music treatments were randomly assigned and the time to complete the test in seconds in seconds and seconds was recorded for each treatment here's the data along with the difference in times for each subject so in this case, this is going to be kind of hitting on the first type of comparing means. So I'm going to go back up. From recording two values of the same quantitative variable for each individual. So I have one individual and they do both. So this is where the individual acts as their own um, control group if we're thinking about in chapter four topics. So this person goes, takes a test with music and then takes a test without or takes the test without and then takes it with. So they're acting as their own control and we can still use a match paired in this example. So they tell us to make a dot plot of the difference, describe the graph and then calculate the mean difference. So right off the bat, making a dot plot, I'm, I'm just taking this data, do it with music, without music. So music minus without music, I could put all this into my calculator, all 30 points. 83, 119, so forth in my L1, 78, continuing on in my L2, and then these, this would, or sorry, 83 and across would be L1, and continuing 78 across would be in my L1, and then L2 would be 70 and across, or 73 and across. Then I would do L3 would be the music, L1 minus L2, to get the difference. 
I could plot each one of those differences here. Um, and this would be my dot plot of the difference. B said, asked to describe what the graph reveals about whether music helps or hinders the map performance. Well, there is some evidence that the music hinders performance of the map test. 17 out of 30 subjects took longer to complete the test when listening to music. So if it's music minus without music, a positive number here means that it took longer for music because it's more seconds. So we can count this up 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. So 17 out of the 30 had a positive difference, meaning that it took longer with music than without. And then part C, we could just use our calculator to find the x bar difference and the standard deviation and just write a little sentence describing those two. So we started off telling you the two forms to get a pair of data. We saw both examples, and then I'm going to wrap it up right here again. So first, researchers can record two variables of the variable of each individual. Um, so this is the listening to music, where that person, each individual has two points of data, and they and you compare them with each other. So that person gets compared to themselves. The second option would be like the twins IQ score. So each person doesn't get paired by themselves, but they get paired to someone who is very similar to them in their in whatever characteristics. So in this example, where they're legitimate twins, maybe if you in if we could tweak the first. Um, the music experiment by if we didn't want each person to take two tests, you could do it where the top two people, one in the class, so person who has the highest grade and the second highest grade, one listens to music, one does not. Then the third and the fourth get paired up, one listens to music, one does not, fifth and sixth, and so forth. Um, and that would fall into the second type of paired data. which is kind of what I just described here. And remember, you want to randomly assign when which person would listen to the music and when they would. So if you are going to use a match, a difference of mean, okay, then the conditions are slightly different. So paired data comes, so when you're talking about randomness, you want to talk about the paired data. It comes from a random sample from the population of interest or from a randomized experiment. 10% condition, um, you're going to use the different, you're going to have to pair everyone up. So you would have to have an even number of n, and therefore your whatever the n is, is less than 10% of the total n. And then the normal or large counts, either the population distribution of the differences um, is normal, or the number of differences in the samples is large. So it's, you have more than 30 samples, 30 people in the sample, or if we don't know the shape and n is less than 30, a graph with the same difference shown, no skewness or no outliers we can use. The formula would be right here. It seems very self-explanatory. It's going to look a lot like 10.1. So that's the nice thing about pairing. When you do match paired, not match paired, but when you do um, paired data, confidence intervals, um, it's going to look a lot like 10.1. So it's going to look like you have one set of data because you've already taken the means and subtracted them. And you're using the difference as that one type, um, or one type of yeah, one type of data point. So that income, the or the the IQ, we already have a little bit of this information. So let's recall in our calculator. We should have stat edit. We should have um, twin A in L1, twin B in L2, and then the difference in L3. So if we were to do this test, right, we got to do state, a 95% confidence interval for the difference, where the mean difference, and it, it tell you what the difference is, high income minus low income, or twin A minus twin B. Then we do our plan, tell me what type of uh, test this is. Since it is paired, paired data, it is a one sample T interval for the difference in the mean. Okay? It is no longer two uh, two sample, it is a one sample since we are looking specifically at the difference. Random sample of 12 pairs of identical twins, um, one raised in a high income and one in a low income. 
then 10%. We assume that, that 12 is less than 10% of all pairs of identical twins raised in separated households. In this world, that is certainly going to be true. Then large counts, um, we don't know, right? We don't know the original shape, and 12 is less than 30, so we're not looking too hot there. We have to use our third way to determine, which is the difference um, on a dot plot, and we show, hey, there are no outliers and no strong skewness in this situation. So we can still proceed. I'm going to do my do. So I'm going to go into stat calc one var stat of L3 to get some information. So our x difference is 5.833. Our standard deviation, sample standard deviation difference is 3.93. Um, our n is 12, so our degrees of freedom is going to be 11. Remember, it doesn't matter. Um, we're not going to, this is looking like a 10.1 where degrees of freedom is just n minus 1. Um, so you could use your T star to do a 95% confidence interval with degrees of freedom 11 and get a T star. And this would be the formula x difference plus or minus T star times sample standard deviation difference divided by square root of n to get that interval. Let me see. You could also do it with our calculator. Test one sample t interval. So it's just straight up t interval. Um, data. I'm going to do L3. L3. Frequency 1. My confidence level is 0.95 this time. Calculate. Should get the same thing. Hopefully. Boom. 3.338. 8.3. Three, so very slight difference in there. Um, so we're good to go with that interval. So that's how you do it on the calculator. This is how you do it by hand. Then we conclude we are 95% confident that the interval from 3.336 to 8.330 captures the true mean difference of high income minus low income in IQ scores among pairs of identical twins raised in separated households. Again, then you might want to state like, hey, does this give us statistical significant evidence? And we would say yes, since zero is not captured in this interval, it does have evidence that um, the high income family does have a higher IQ than the low income family, since all these are positive and we're going high minus low. High minus low, a positive number means that the higher income is larger than the lower. And therefore we do have evidence since zero is not in this range or in this interval, not in this range, in this interval. All right. And that is kind of the end of 10.2. So you should have been able to do these learning targets, determine whether the conditions are met for doing in inference about a difference between two means, construct and interpret a confidence interval for a difference between two means, analyze the distribution of differences in a paired data set using graphs and summary statistics, and construct and interpret a confidence interval for a mean difference.